Hi, I'm James Robson from the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations at Harvard University. I've been running a project for two years as part of the From the Ground Up uh, research project here at the University of British Columbia. And we've spent uh, doing two years uh, doing research in Korea and Japan, and we'll do one more project in China next year. One of the things I'd like to impress upon you is to look at statues in East Asia in a very different way than you've probably become accustomed to, which is most people will look at a statue and look at its external iconography. And what I want you to do is to think a bit, little bit about how those statues are filled with contents and filled with meaning. Over the last few years, the increase in technology has allowed us to look at statues in a very different way than, have, than was available to people in the past. Take, for example, this image from Spain from the 18th century. When it was uh, taken down for restoration work, they found that in the body of the image, there were texts that were located in the, uh, the rear end of this uh, image, and that those uh, documents were telling the local history of a village in Spain. In other parts of the world, we also have found that many of the statues have things tucked away inside of them that nobody knew about until the, those statues were x-rayed or had used a CT scan to analyze them. These two images from West Africa show that in the belly of the statue they would keep different medicines and sometimes uh, documents and other uh, objects that are put into them. Recently, uh, an image was put on display in a, at a museum in Europe and uh, when they were preparing the image for, uh, des for display, they uh, found that at the base of the image, when they separated it from the, the, the pedestal, uh, bones fell out of it. And therefore, they took the image uh, to the uh, hospital and put it through a CT scan machine and found that on the inside of this was the actual full body relic of a, mo of a monk who had lived uh, in China in around the 11th or 12th century. So this has opened scholars' eyes to thinking about a different way of looking at images and what they might hold inside of them. Over the past 20 years or so in Japan, there's been a, uh, an increase in the scholarship on looking at images and trying to find out what types of uh, secrets they might hold in their inner cavities. This image from the Hokkeiji uh, was in the press just this last year in Japan as an example of one of these images that they uh, did CT scans of and found that the torso and the head were filled with documents, small images, and other ritual objects. The amazing thing is now with the quality of these scans, they were able to see that there were about 170 different documents that were kept and manuscripts that were kept uh, put inside of this statue. Some time ago, a very famous scholar in Japan named Kurata Bunsaku had published an issue of this Japanese art uh, journal. And this was one of the first publications that really opened scholars' eyes to the fact that there were many statues throughout Japan that had objects that were put inside of them. These, uh, the collection that he brought together here was uh, based on statues that were brought in for restoration. And when they began to do the restoration work, they realized that the statues had cavities in them that contained many things. The most famous one at that time was an image called the Seiryoji Shaka from the 10th century. This image had been brought over from China, but when it was opened, uh, it turned around uh, and opened up. It's about a life, it's a life-size statue, and it was filled with uh, documents. In, there's an inscription. Uh, there are uh, uh, medicine inside and uh, hundreds of pieces of cloth. One of the most interesting things is that this, the statue also had a full set of uh, silk organs that were put in at the time of the consecration, which means that these statues then when underwent a consecration ritual where they were uh, enlivened. And after these objects were put inside, the statue was considered to be a living image. For this project, uh, we've been looking at different types of these consecration rituals in Japan, China, and Korea. And in each of these cultures, they have a different form of consecration ritual, but they're really based on a very similar type of process if the details are a little bit different in each case. 
We shouldn't have been surprised about these discoveries that have happened over the last 20 years or so. In fact, going back to the early 20th century, we already have some textual evidence from missionaries who went to East Asia and wrote about the contents of statues as they were trying to convert those in East Asia to Christianity, and they thought that these uh, types of statues were too idolatrous, and therefore they would take the contents out and send them back to Europe as a proof that they had completed a conversion of somebody. And these were kept uh, at the London Missionary Society for a long time, and then most of them have disappeared. Even an article in the uh, uh, 1926 uh, article in the New York Times uh, described a statue being prepared for auction and the owner of it being surprised when they were uh, carting it off to the auction house of having uh, all kinds of uh, objects that fell out of the statue at that time and it surprised them. Finally, in the 19th century, a Christian missionary named Hamden DuBose published a book uh, writing about the religions of China and had a chapter called The Idol Factory uh, that shows them carving the carvers at work in their studio. The interesting thing is that in the woodcuts that were, uh, that were published with it, they even show the backsides of the images with the cavities already prepared for the objects that would go inside of them. So as we look around museums today and other collections, we find many of these types of statues that had objects uh, from text to materia medica to other objects, uh, small statues even, that were put in time at the time of consecration. Many of them date from around the 11th century up to the present day. And the, the quantity of materials inside of them can be quite astounding. This small image of Shotoku uh, that's at the Harvard Art Museum is a good example. This one had all uh, types of dedicatory uh, texts that were put inside when the image was consecrated. And these allow us then to know something about the popular religious practices of those who were responsible for the consecration. These types of documents are rare for us as scholars to have access to when we normally just have printed texts of the elite, and this allows us to say something about uh, a lower level of religious practice. And in this case, many of them were nuns. This one at the Met uh, also shows that, uh, that, in fact, images that were in museums or are in museums today around the world, uh, in many cases, are just shown to us from a frontal perspective. But when you look at the backside, you can see that even those had cavities. And we need to look at the acquisition records to see when they uh, brought the statue into the museum that, in many cases, they found materials inside of those statues and only kept them in notes. But uh, people today have no idea what's there. Uh, including this Guanyin from the Seattle Art Museum as well. So we spent uh, two summers doing research in Korea here, going around to temples, looking at images and their contents, and trying to understand the religious world that uh, led up to those uh, practices beginning, and also trying to assess the value of the, of the materials that are inside of them. I've been focusing mainly on the documents, uh, manuscripts, and prints that have been put inside of these statues. In other cases, we have clothing that also had writing on them. And by analyzing these, we are given a different view of religion than what we find just in printed canonical sources. Many of these are either texts that didn't survive to the present day, or they're considered uh, devotional objects uh, that are unique in having uh, just the names of the donors and the reasons why they consecrated it. This picture for, is from the storage room at the Kanazawa Bunko in Japan, uh, looking at the contents of three statues, uh, where in many cases, uh, the prints that are inside there were just uh, uh, devotional prints that were made solely for the purpose of the donors uh, in order to create a connection with the, with the image. So where did it all begin? It actually tracks back all the way to India. We know that stupas, or these uh, architectural structures that were built, were meant to have inside of them either a relic of the Buddha or a document. And when we look at these texts, it says that all of them should have these things when they're put inside. And indeed, in the uh, Chinese travelers who went to India report about these, this practice going on in India for stupas, but in some cases also write about images and that they should also have a place in the head or the back where they should have a document that's put inside. So it seems that this practice is quite old and goes back all the way to the time of when Buddhism was being practiced in India and then was transmitted to China. We have lists also of the objects that should go inside of a statue when it's consecrated. 
And we have documents that show how a, a statue should be carved and the materials that should go inside of it as well. The views of those or why things were put inside of them are various. They're, some of them are purely for devotional reasons, but for us as scholars, it really becomes a kind of time machine in a way to go back and look at types, the types of things that have not been preserved in other types of sources. Therefore, I hope that after this project, we'll begin to prove the fact that it wasn't just uh, special images that had things inside of them, but in fact, our assumption should be that all images had things that were put inside of them at the time that they were consecrated. And it's the goal of this project in many ways to assess how we can use those materials. But I also hope that people will begin to look at images in museums in a different way and realize that they have been enlivened. And for people who were devoted to those images, they're considered to being the living presence of the Buddha.